Hello, my name is Bill Bogardis. I'm the treasurer of the lightning class, and welcome to Fridays at 5. Uh, today, we have a presentation on the racing rules. Today's presentation is sponsored by the lightning class and the snipe class. We're happy that you could attend today's presentation. In this time of lockdown, I have some suggestions to make this time more enjoyable. Number one, engage. Do what we're doing today. Talk to your fellow competitors. Uh, talk to them about rigging. Talk to them about rules. Uh, review one of the many webinars that have gone up in the last few weeks, or maybe just have a beer. But definitely try to engage and keep sailing at the forefront. Second, support your class. Uh, webinars like this don't go off if we don't have strong class organizations. So please, pay your dues to the Snipe class, pay your dues to the Lightning class, consider making a donation. Uh, that way we can continue this content uh, for the foreseeable future. And finally, stay positive. Uh, when I was a sailing coach, I literally had one old Luther Carpenter VHS tape that I would share back and forth between Manasquan Yacht Club and Manaloking Yacht Club on rainy days. <laughs> After this pandemic, think about all of the many hours of tuning and boat handling and rules that all the future coaches are gonna have right at their very fingertips, right on YouTube videos, right at the lightning class and snipe class. So there is a positive that comes from this pandemic. And now on to our presenters. First, uh, Daryl Wasco. Daryl is both a snipe and a lightning sailor, so he's got both classes covered. Uh, he is a United States and international judge, uh, and he's someone who understands and appreciates the more technical aspects of the rule book and has a way that he can explain it that's helpful to you and me. So I'm really excited to have Daryl here to help with the, with the rules chat. Our other presenter is Jan O'Malley. Now, when your father's an Olympic gold medalist in sailing, you might think it would be difficult to carve out your own niche in the sailing world, but Jan's done that and more. Jan is a three-time U.S. Sailing Yachts Person of the Year. She's an IYRU World Champion, a two-time Adams Cup Champion, but she's also a senior judge for many years, and she was the judge for the 92, 96, and 2004 Olympic trials. And more importantly, and I can speak from personal experience on this, uh, if you grew up in New Jersey, you knew Jan was someone that was always very generous with her time, especially with junior sailors. If you had a rules question, performance question, she'd be more than happy to help you out and answer those questions. So I'm really excited to have Jan here today as well. And with that, um, thank you for coming and it's, up, it's on you, Daryl and Jan. So today we're gonna to do something a little different. Like often the rules, um, the Dave Perry books, a lot of things you can find online, they're literally about the rules boat on boat. Like what do you do on port or starboard? What do you do on a mark rounding? And we're gonna take a different tact. We're gonna talk about the rules from a very high level. I don't mean high level in that discussion, but a high level in the broad sense. We wanna, how do you plan a regatta? What do you talk to the judges about? And this is the kind of talk that I also want to have with people, even though it's more presentational than I want. If this was 10 or 20 people, we'd really have a discussion. With uh, 40, we're going to be more presentable, but you know, put your questions in the chat. We'll figure it out. Um, we want to be able to ask some questions that when you're really literally running an event, you don't say, what rule do you want? Do you want this enforced? Do you want this not enforced? Like, you know, once you've decided whether you're gonna have a designated hitter or not, you don't go back and change your mind. So this is the kind of form where we can have those discussions a little bit. And then also toward the end, we can certainly do boat on boat once we get past our, uh, the main part of our presentation. So for the first part, I'm gonna do a lot of the talking for the first point, and then Jan's gonna be able to fill in a few, a few this and that. So regatta planning. You know, what are the regatta planners, judges, what should you talk about when you're starting a regatta, when you're planning a regatta, you know, months in advance? And this is more toward the class officers, the fleet captains, the people that run events. And then we're going to talk about videos, like when can you use them in hearings? We're going to talk about the thing I'm noticing is there's more and more video everywhere. We'll talk a little about that. Um, Jan's going to talk about Rule 69. And then we're just going to throw it open to a few what ifs, like should we or should we not enforce rule 42? If you had a magic wand, what are the other rules you'd want changed? And then, as I already said, we'll get to boat on boat. So we're data planning. 
Often at the start of a regatta, the judges sit down and they have their first meeting. And this is a straw man question that's almost said at every, the start of every judge's group meeting. If someone hits the weather mark and you're the boat assigned at the weather mark and you see the lead boat hit the weather mark and no other competitor is there, what should the judges do? And it's, it's a question that actually almost 90% of the time the chief judge answers by saying, if that happens, let me know. So you don't actually answer the question, but it gives the judges a few minutes to talk through what's this class like? What level regatta are we at? Do we want to enforce the rules super tight? Is this an Olympic trials or a Pan Am Games or the world? Is this a regatta that's a little casual? And you're not going to change the rules. Like we're not going to go in and say port's different than starboard, but you know, the penalties for throwing trash overboard, the penalties for check-in, like all those little around the edges decisions, how are we going to deal with all those? And if you've talked to the class rep or you've talked to the regatta planner, you know, you're going to talk about, are you going to weigh clothing? Do you want international jury? Are we going to enforce rule 42? Are we going to do arbitration? People think arbitration sometimes is a lot of work, but often it lets people come ashore, decide what they did or didn't do, and take a percentage penalty instead of going to the room and risking being DSQ'd. So all these things, alternate penalties, fleet umpiring, you should have had a discussion broadly with your PRO, your chief judge, and the regatta planner, and often these are left unsaid. And you don't want to reinvent the wheel. Like, I know what the answers to most of these are for most snipe and lightning regattas. But on the other hand, I've been to regattas where the planning was, do you want turkey sandwiches and ham sandwiches for lunch? Like, I got no input at all from the class. So if you get no input and you're either the PRO or you're the chief judge, you end up with a lot of out by the book wrote answers because you think that's what the class wants. So another question I've been asking when I'm planning regattas now is who is the OA? A lot of times at that title at the top of the NOR, it might say the class, it might say the fleet, it might say an individual club. Sometimes it says all three. I've actually seen them where they forget to put somebody down and they just say it's the snipe districts or the lightning districts. The reason that's an important question is now in the rules, the OA can be a party. So just like the race committee, the protest committee, other members, you might have a hearing and it's possible that the OA might need to be represented in a protest hearing. And the last time you wanna figure out who the actual person and who's representing the OA is in the middle of a dinner when there's a protest you know, on the other side of the compound. So just in the early planning from the OA, Who's going to represent the OA if there's a hearing or if there's an immediate question that involves an on the water thing and you don't have to fight through who is it, you know. Often the regatta planner is someone who's totally in charge of the on the land stuff and they really don't know anything about the on the water stuff. So you want to work through those issues. So now I've introduced all that. Really, excuse me, what do the sailors want? So before the event, we just laid through all that stuff. Do you want to weigh clothing? Do you want rule 42? It gets subtler than that. If I'm given an SI and it's 10 pages long and it has three pages that are an addendum that tell you what all the alternate penalties are, if you throw trash in, it's 10%. If you're late at check-in, it's 20%. Like, like that's a pretty much by the book regatta. Like that kind of regatta, someone's thought this all through, the class has an opinion, they really want it done a certain way. Um, you know, once you actually finalize the SIs and you decided what the alternate penalties are, you're pretty much, most judges will make a good decision in the hearing so that a lot of people think the rules are what happens in the hearing and what the two boats did against each other. A lot of that to me is set in stone a week before the regatta because you've defined are the penalties written in stone and you have to penalize this for that infraction or is it at the discretion of the jury if it's at the discretion of the jury the jury is going to have their own meeting and say before things start we think for this kind of penalty we're going to do this kind of uh, infraction and 
Uh, I did a Pan Am trials a few years ago, and one of the things that the uh, OA, the representative of the regatta, myself and the PRO decided was they wanted there would be safety checks, arbitrary safety checks of the first five boats. So after you finished a race, you had to pick one of the boats and have them come over and hold up all their safety gear. And we wrote down before the start of each race whether it was going to be one, three, or five so that we felt we didn't have any bias because everybody knows the sailors, everybody you know, knows somebody in some way. So you're, what you're trying to do is remove bias and be consistent. So once you get to the actual, once racing starts, I'm not sure I want to be lobbied. Like I don't want people to come in and tell me do this or don't do that. I want that all to happen in the pre part. So here's a little thing most people don't think of. It's easy to ch change the penalty for a rule. It's hard to change a rule. So if you want to change a rule in the class, there's a procedure, it goes through the governing body or through the board. But for one regatta, for one thing, if you say, we really don't have a problem with people checking in and we don't want to emphasize a check-in penalty, you just say to the jury, be lenient on that before racing starts, or that's something we want to write down and put a notice up and say the penalty for that is no penalty. Because what the jury's goal is to be consistent once the sailing starts. So once you say do this or don't do that, that's going to be kind of the tenor of the whole regatta. So your wants, suggestions, the tendency, they're all part of the regatta, but they all have to be sort of brought up in the planning. Okay, so let's move to the next slide. Okay, so this is a story that I got from Tom Duggan. He ran a, a good PRO race management seminar a couple of weeks ago that was a U.S. sailing webinar. And I'm just going to repeat what he said. It was a light air day. The boats were drift, towed out. They drifted around for a while. Eventually, they got some racing in. When the scores were posted hours later that night, there were a whole bunch of check-in penalties. And when the class asked the PRO what happened, they said, we were following the rules. And the rules had a 20% check-in penalty assigned in those SIs. So in the planning, somebody said, do this. The jury looked at it. The PRO looked at it. They did what the thing said. The fleet was hated it. They thought that was unfair. They thought that was a terrible way to start off a regatta to have people, when they waved to the race committee and checked in, for them to be found getting a penalty because not everybody was on starboard when they were drifting around. So that's the kind of thing of sometimes there's things in the rules that have just been in there forever. Like, have you really gone through your class rules recently and looked at your championship rules and said, you know, that's what we want done, you know, because sometimes it's not what you want done. And sometimes you can leave it to the discretion of the jury. And sometimes it's something that eventually you want to make a change. But, you know, somebody will say, we put that rule in because in 20 years ago, this thing happened this one time. Be careful. You don't want to take all the discretion away from the PRO and all the discretion away from the judges. You have to decide what do you want to allow and what do you want not to allow. And I think a great story, I wasn't at the Shagata, but there was a Snipe Nationals and it was out in the, um, Colorado on a big lake. And the Snipes have all kinds of rules about if the wind shifts 20 degrees or 30 degrees on the first triangle, you have to blow it off. And everybody knew at that regatta, if you followed those rules, they'd never get a race off. So there was a little dis bit of discretion there. Everybody knew that they couldn't apply the championship rules in that case. They got a regatta in and everybody raced. They knew the conditions were slightly different than what those rules were literally um, written for. So again, a class wrap, a couple meetings, some good planning discussions can, can be a big help to your team. I mean, the best judges I know, the PROs and judges, they tailor their planning and decisions and regatta documents to what the class wants. And if you get no input, then you, do, you get a by the book decision. And in that example that I was giving a few minutes ago about the check-in penalty, I know two classes I work with a lot and I run their regattas over and over again. And each of those two classes would come up with a different answer. One would say, they didn't follow the rules. We want everybody to be treated the same. We definitely want those penalties applied. And the other class I work with a lot would have gone, 
that's ridiculous. We're here to, we're, we're on vacation. We're all amateurs. We, we want to, that, that's a silly way to start a regatta off and why, you know, why just aggravate everybody? Um, so, okay. So I'm going to, the next section is videos. I'm just going to oh, look. Do you have anything to yeah, add? Can I just throw in two cents? Sure. <laughs> I, I, I think the main point is that it is really important for the judges, the organizing authority, the class rep and the host club or the PRO to get together in advance. And you as competitors may not know that that is happening, but it really does start months, months in advance. And it really is worth the time and trouble to dot the I's and cross the T's. And then the competitors are, well, the regatta will go off much better and the competitors will have a much better time and have a better feeling about how they were treated. Yeah. That's it. So, so Jan and I were at a regatta and we're not going to say where and when. And we were asked to be judges and we read all the regatta documents and we started asking the PRO and the other regatta organizers about the event. And they hadn't read their own SIs and their own NR. Like we were literally saying, how are we going to do this? And they said, well, we weren't planning to do that. And we said, well, the documents you've sent to the competitors say you're going to do that. And then we move on to the next issue and we say, how are you going to do that? And they say, well, we don't plan to do that. And it was in the SIs and NOR. So sometimes you need someone on your team to just even look at what the organization is putting out because occasionally they just miss it. Like if your regatta team and regatta planner is someone who's more a shoreside person, there's somebody on your team should still be looking at the documents and making sure the, the, the water side is being run the way, the way you want. So um, just one final thought on that. The other thing that we're getting more complicated on is just regatta software. Like does your regatta and your club normally run regatta network? Do you use a different software platform? Do you use it all by hand? Because those are the kind of things that now I like to know about a couple of weeks in advance because if I don't, if I've never used that platform before, I want to be able to log in, see what it does, see how it works, and not be fumbling with it an hour when I'm trying to be in protest, run a new software platform. And then if you're using software, who has login, who has access, who's your IT person, who's in charge of passwords, and you know, so that's another layer, and we don't need to belabor, but that's just another layer in your plea be planning to, to take care of. Yeah, there's nothing worse than slow scoring to ruin a regatta. <laughs> I've, I've witnessed that a couple of times. Right. I mean, I would say at most regattas, if I'm from an out-of-towner and I come in and I'm new to a regatta and I hang out at that place for a couple of days or a week, the person I know the best at the end of the regatta is the scorer. That's the person who I end up knowing the best. So, all right. So, um, we'll move on. Jan, any final thoughts or you can just go yes or no. Or... No, no, go ahead. Yeah. So we're going to move on to videos. And the reason I threw this into the presentation is there's evidence, which is official and it's all part of the hearing. And then we're all seeing media more and more everywhere. And I'm learning that this is becoming like the talk of the regatta party. So whether you're right or wrong or whether something happened or didn't happen officially, there's lots of rumor mills and lots of guesses of what should or shouldn't happen. So I think about it, the coaches, spectators, drones, media boats, online, and yes, the regatta party, cameras and playback are everywhere. So, you know, thinking you saw something and you ruled on it or didn't rule on it or became a protest or didn't become a protest. That's almost beside the point. And we're getting to be in the same situation as baseball and football. Somebody makes a call, something happened on the water, you think the regatta is over. And then at the bar or at the regatta party, there's a 54 inch TV that shows two boats crashing and everybody wants to know who was right, who was wrong, what happened? So we're going to just start with videos in the protest hearing. Um, oh, sorry. Okay, videos in the protest hearing. So that's pretty straightforward. If there's a video and somebody wants to present it as evidence, when you're in a protest and you're asked to give evidence, it's the person's responsibility to present the evidence 
So if I walk in and I'm protesting Jan and I say I have this video, I have to have the video, I have to have the playback device, I have to literally present it as I would any other evidence and say, here it is. So it's not the OA's job or the, or the protest committee's job. If you say I want video, you have to have the playback, the video, and make sure it all happens. So Jan, remind me to talk about reopening when we get to that later. Okay. Yeah. Um, so then the next thing, so here's the Star North Americans. Augie's right there at the mark. He's actually hitting the mark. The boat above him is actually going up a little bit. We got George Zabo in third there coming in and charging around. And this was about a 30 second clip that was shown at the regatta at the party after we came in sailing for the day. And it just showed a pile up at the windward mark and everybody had their opinion about what rules broken and who was guilty and what happened. And the interesting thing about this is that Augie did his protest turns and the whole protest had nothing to do with what was shown on the video. The video was a foul and the protest turned on when were the turns done, were the turns done appropriately and were the turns done at soon as possible and did he result in a gain or not gain as a result of doing the penalty turn. So what the bar and the video people were talking about was totally different than what the decision was based on and what the protest actually turned out to be. So a lot of times there's that perception difference of everybody thinks there's something happening and you want to just be prepared. And the reason I'm bringing this up is if there was a protest, should it be reopened? We'll get to that in a moment. But if there was no protest and you're the OA or you're the regatta chair, how egregious does the foul have to be before you're concerned? And there is no answer to that question. I'm not raising that question like I know the answer or, or can say this is what you do or don't do at the time. But I just think that's something for regatta organizers, for class officers, for people that run regattas, just to think about. You know, if there's no protest and you see a big T-bone or you see somebody hit the mark and it's all over the social media for your regatta, what are you, what's your opinion about that? And you shouldn't have a rash decision right at that second. You should have had some contemplation that in our world with video on demand all the time, that's going to happen sooner or later. So I'm going to back up to if there's a protest, well, everyone will see it and see the video, they'll see a foul, and then they'll see that there was a protest. It's very likely there was a protest, the protest was decided, and then the, the video hits social media. And there's an interesting point that all the judges are trained on that I'm not sure all the sailors know. And to get new evidence in a hearing, so to reopen a hearing, you need new evidence. New evidence has to be new from when the hearing was. It just, has, it just can't be rehashed of the same thing. So if you come into it and ask for a redress hearing, one of the things you're most likely going to be asked by the jury is, is this evidence new? And if you say, yes, it's a video that I saw on TV overnight or I found on the internet, the second question they're going to ask is, did you make any attempt to find this evidence when you made you first filed your hearing? And if you say no, there's a really good chance the jury's going to say, redress, sorry, reopening denied. So if I'm, oh. can everybody still see and hear me? It looks like your share just dropped. Oh, now it's back. Okay, I'm back. Oh, but you're on the wrong slide. Uh, all right, here we go, folks. Okay. So, yeah, my computer just had a glitch, of course. So, um, so anyway, back to where we were. Talking about reopening. One of the issues of reopening is if I was a competitor and I was involved in a foul and I knew I was going to the protest room, between protest time and the protest, I would ask around. I'd ask the OA. Remember earlier I said, who's the personal representative of the OA on the site? I'd ask if there's an official media boat. I personally would say, does anyone have video that they can share with me? And even if I didn't get the video, when somebody in the hearing said, is there video of this? I would say, I asked around and tried to get it and nobody can answer my question of where the video is for this event. 
Then if you have to reopen and subsequently video shows up, I can at least say, I tried to find it, I was looking for it, nobody made it available for the hearing. So there's a very subtle point there that I'll just recap, that if you ask for a reopening, there needs to be new evidence, and you have to have made an effort to try to have found evidence before your first hearing. So in a reopening, I would make an effort to try to find any video if I was at a regatta. Okay, so here we go. I just pulled this off the internet. I have no personal knowledge of whether they missed each other, whether they hit each other, what happened here. But imagine this is a minute video and it's up on your regatta party. Everybody's gonna be talking about this. So did starboard duck and miss? Is port so fast that we just caught them at the moment and they're blazing by and there was no incident at all? You know, this snapshot doesn't really tell us what happened, but I would think, if this was live and this was a big TV screen, it would get everybody's attention. So after protest time closes, if you actually are a regatta organizer or you're the class rep or you're the fleet captain in regatta, the protest time is closed. It's a self-policing sport. We all expect that the sailors are gonna protest each other, that it's an on the water thing when two people do it. If you say to the jury, it's after protest time, that was on TV, you should do something about it. There's only a couple options the jury have. We can't reopen if there's never been a protest submitted. The protest committee has a couple choices. We could ask for redress. And if you ask for redress, you can do a lot of things. One of the things that could happen is if you said something has to be done is that race could be abandoned. A race can be abandoned after the fact. I'm not sure that's a good idea. I'm not recommending it. I'm just saying that's one of the few possibilities to happen. Um, the other thing that could happen is you could extend protest time, but the only thing the protest committee is allowed to extend protest time for if there was no incident involved in the first place is if there's serious damage or if there's an injury. So if two boats T-boned each other, or if you know somebody got hurt, that's the kind of report the jury can act on without there being an original protest. So you now I'm just laying out the thoughts there that in the media world with pictures and video everywhere, we should all think a little bit more about as regatta organized, what do we think about all that video that we see? And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Jan because the other thing that the race committee, sorry, the protest committee, anybody could do this actually, the race committee, the protest committee, they could file a rule 69 report if they really thought it was an egregious event. And I'm gonna let Jan talk about redraw, I'm sorry, about rule 69. Okay, so the first question uh, that might come to mind is, why are we talking about rule 69 at all? Um, and I have two reasons for this, first is, this isn't a normal rules talk, as Daryl mentioned at the beginning. We're sort of doing surround rules, not uh, rule, you know, racing rules or part two rules. But secondly, over time, the racing rules have changed and rule 69 uh, covers a lot more ground and behavior than it used to. And I just think sailors aren't always aware of the risks that might be out there. So, so that's why we're talking about it today. Um, I just, I put in this link for you. This is a link to a PDF file that's on the World Sailing website. It is a terrific document. It goes over everything with respect to uh, Rule 69. Uh, it gives examples of what is the kind of behavior that would fall under this rule. It tells the protest committee how to conduct a hearing. It gives suggested penalties. It is the book on Rule 69, so I just provided the, um, the link for you there. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so first question that may come to mind is, when, does rule, when should it be Rule 2 and when should it be 69? Well, there is overlap, and, and so it's a legitimate question. Um, but uh, the uh, rule two is more often on the water 
and, and actually, Laura, I'm assuming you can copy and paste the link for me. <laughs> um, but it's more, you, it's usually on the water, boats versus boat, and sportsmanship and, and fair play. Um, something like the picture or the scenario um, Daryl described, somebody hit a mark, nobody was there to see it, you know, did they do their turn? Um, the rule 69 is more likely ashore and is usually more serious. It could uh, include unethical behavior or um, putting the sport in disrepute. Uh, next slide, please. So I've, I've copied in here the portion of the rule that, of rule 69 that defines misconduct. So these are the things that you could that a protest committee could open a hearing about, um, I'll say against you. So the first thing is a Rule 69 um, hearing is about a competitor, a boat owner, or a support person. Unlike the, the racing rules, the you know rule, uh, rule section two rules that are about a boat. Okay, then they define misconduct, conduct that is a breach of good manners. Now that is certainly a subject, subjective uh, thing. A breach of good sportsmanship, which is perhaps, it's still subjective, but maybe there's a little bit more idea of what it is, or an, a, a unethical behavior, and conduct that may bring the sport into disrepute. So, you know, these are pretty general things. Is it a breach of good manners to uh, swear at your com competitor? They ducked inside you at the mark and, and you swear at them. Um, or in fact, if you did duck inside of the mark, was that a breach of good sportsmanship? So, so I'll say a, a lot of behavior can fall under this rule. So I, I just, and trying to bring out the fact that, that there's a pretty large scope here. Uh, next slide. Okay, so I actually already mentioned this. Who can be protested? First of, first of all, it is the protest committee that initiates the protest. It's not a boat or a person. The, the, uh, and who can be protested is a person, not a boat. The protest committee has to be made up of at least three people. Um, and the Rule 69 hearings are separate and different from other hearings in four main ways. It, the action under Rule 69 is not a protest. Action under Rule 69 is against a competitor, boat owner, or support person. Um, it can only be initiated by, the pro by a protest committee. And this is an important thing. A protest committee has the discretion on whether or not to proceed to a hearing. Um, I, I would say Rule 69 um, is procedural heavy. Um, it ha can have very serious consequences. Protest committees tend not to get too involved, but depending on the severity of the issue, um, they can choose to proceed to a hearing or not, depending on the situation. Uh, next slide. So one of the things that a protest committee can do if they don't think they have enough information to make the decision to call a hearing or about the substance of the accusation also, they can appoint an investigator, the investigator then it goes investigates everything and then come back, comes back to the protest committee uh, with all of the information and then it can decide whether or not to proceed. And then if it does proceed, all of that information will be disclosed to all of the parties. Uh, next slide. Okay, so an important question is, what is the standard of proof? Um, Daryl mentioned, you know, when you go into a protest hearing, it's sometimes the, or it's, it's often said that you've got a 50-50 chance. It's pretty unpredictable um, what the outcome might be. We, we try to make that as good as we can, but, but it is somewhat unpredictable. Um, for Rule 69 hearings, the standard of proof is higher than in a protest hearing. 
and and then that is because the serious the seriousness of the misconduct and seriousness of the penalty can be larger so um they do say and this this comes out of that world sailing uh pdf that i told you about um <coughs> it says comfortable satisfaction so that's the standard of proof for rule 69. Uh, well and of course there are exceptions with the laws of the country but i'm not going to go into that now uh next slide please <coughs> excuse me so this, this slide also comes from that same uh, World Sailing Guidance, but they have six uh, levels of recommended penalties. And first is interview with a competitor, but no hearing. I would say that happens in a large uh, number of cases. I recently was judging a youth event. One of the competitors Said, some, uh, said something like, you idiot, to another competitor. And there, there was more involved than this, but, but there was a protest and a, um, and a request for a Rule 69 hearing. We ended up uh, speaking to the competitor and to the coach of that competitor, but did not have a hearing. Um, so then um, you can just give a warning with no penalty. Um, and, you know, maybe that might be the appropriate thing for an adult uh, swearing or, or at another competitor at the race committee. Um, you could actually provide a penalty where in which you would increase this, you know, make the boat score worse. Um, you could disqualify the boat or exclude the competitor from a number of races. You could disqualify them completely from the event or disqualify them from the event and remove all privileges. Now, part of this, one of the things that happens is these uh, cases do get recommend or, or can go forward to the governing body of the sport, to US sailing in our case, um, for further adjudication. Uh, next slide. Oh, um, there are three uh, world sailing cases that um, have to do with Rule 69. And actually, I was thinking when I looked at some of the questions in the, the spreadsheet uh, when people signed up, um, one of the things that I do when I'm trying to go into more detail about any rule is I go to the world sailing case book and I search for the term I'm looking for and often that's the cases are the things i rely on rely on to make the very fine points on a rule and and so i recommend that in general but here i did bring out the the three cases that are um relevant so case 34 is hindering another boat may be a breach of rule two and the basis for granting redress for action under 69.2 uh, next one, and I, I think this one and I think it's the next one. Yeah, this one. In a fleet race, either for one design boats or for boats racing under a handicap, a boat may use tactics that clearly interfere with or hinder another boat's progress in the race, provided that if she is protested or under rule two, they find that her tactics benefited her final ranking in the event or chances for gaining selection, but you can't break a rule in part two. Now this goes back to Russ Silvestri in the Olympic trials, and I forget which year that was, but this case came specifically out of those trials. Uh, next slide. And case 138. So generally, generally any action by a competitor that directly affects the fairness of the, of the competition, um, and if they are aware of breaking a rule should be considered under rule two. So this is making the distinction between where rule two should be used and rule 69 should be used. And they, any action, including a serious breach of rule two or other rule, they can consider whether there would be action under 69. So I mean, I think that's the last slide, isn't it, Daryl? Yeah. So I noticed, I didn't look at the, were there any, um, Okay, you just posted the link, so there were no other questions. 
Correct, Jan, no questions. So. Okay. okay, well, that's, that's all I was going to say about that. Uh, so I'll turn it back to Daryl. Okay. Yeah, so I was just going to add, I was at a major regatta once and they had five circles and big boats and dinghies and it was a huge event and there was a rule 69. And in that case, the crew of one of the big boats had done something and the penalty was the boat should, could still sail in the regatta, but the crew and the skipper were banned from the yacht club and couldn't come into the social events. So there are all kinds of ramifications that are possible under, under those. Very yeah, the one big case I was involved in it was a it was a um, offshore boat that it had been measured in um, with some lead in the boat. Afterwards, the owner had somebody remove the weight. Um, somebody learned of it. That that particular boat owner was uh, removed from, from sailing for two years. So they there's a wide uh, range of things that uh, can happen in our sport. So so yeah. So 69. Let's let's move on from 69 because hopefully we're not doing that very often. So a magic wand. This is the thing we don't often talk about as competitors and. You know, in the middle of the regatta, in the middle of the racing, you don't talk about what rules should be or shouldn't be. So the classes all have procedures that you can propose a rule change. You can, you know, try to make your case and, you know, get something changed. Sometimes stuff is just archaic. It's been there for 20 years and nobody remembers or people do remember, but times have changed. So, for example, should Rule 42 be enforced? And the story I've heard from the Lightnings is they tried it at a world championship and the fleet didn't agree with some of the calls and they don't want to do it anymore. And the reason I'm bringing that up is some classes want it, some classes don't want it. If the class feels that everybody is broadly speaking following Rule 42 and they don't think it's a problem, we don't need to change that. So this is just sort of my kind of query of, I don't think we, it, this forum got to be too big to do these one-on-one -on -one kind, of, kind of conversations, but you know, either email me or, you know, talk to the class officers, but if anybody has a strong opinion one way or the other, we don't need to mess with what's, what's not wrong. But if people think people are taking advantage of that, you could do rule 42. So this is just the broad sense of what I wanted to get at. Are there rules that should be changed or rules that are fine the way they are? Snipes do do rule 42 at major championships. And the one thing I know about the Snipes is when they first started doing rule 42, they got into some trouble with a few people got three penalties because they weren't used to the enforcement. And the snipes like to do, at least in the US, rule 42 with the P1, the one penalty always being due turn so that you don't send home, send people home at a regatta. I mean, some of the things is like, we're doing things a little different than the Olympics. Like we are mostly amateurs. We're mostly doing this for fun. One of the things that I get a feel definitely out of the snipes and is that you know they didn't want to actually have regatta penalties that send send somebody home when they were on vacation to come and enjoy an event. So just like other rules, you can spin forever, but we don't want to enforce P three. So yeah, I, I mean that's that's a perfect example of something that should be talked through in before the event starts, so you get the right sense because it's an easy change to the sailing instructions to take that out so you can always do a turn or uh, two turns if you are flagged. Right. So this format's a little big to actually get what do we want to change in our rules, but just think of through the idea of, do you want to push something through the class leadership and get a rule change for something minor or something that's very local? Like there's some real key thing in your harbor and that's an issue. That's something that can be done in the SIs or done in the NOR. Rule 86 actually talks about what rules an NOR can change, what rules the SIs can change, what rules only the class can change. And depending on the answer to those things, they're technical answers, they're each in different categories. Sometimes for a very short-term local event, the easiest thing to do is just either to actually write in or just tell the PRO and the judges, you know, this is what we want. That one thing is not something we want enforced. 
I think a good example is the snipes always write the black flag out of their sailing instructions. They, they don't want to send people home. If you go over the line, you can get a Z flag penalty as many starts as there are, and you can rack up 20, 40, 60%, but they don't want people not to sail. So even a big multi-class regatta, if you're stuck with SIs that don't quite match the way your class normally does it, you could have a discussion with the PRO. You could say, in the snipe class, we don't want you to use the black flag. The PRO doesn't even have to do anything. He doesn't have to plant a notice. He doesn't have to change his eyes. But if he's running starts for two, three, four, five classes, but he knows the snipes hate the black flag, the PRO may use the black flag. So if he knows that one class doesn't like it, he doesn't have to use it, or he or she doesn't have to use it in that particular case. So these are the kind of things where good discussions lead to better regattas for the competitors. Um, I said earlier in the regatta, in those, in the regatta of the uh, slide presentation, the, um, some of the best PRIs I know are the ones who want to know what the class wants. Like, if you run a lot of regattas, you know one class likes A, one class likes B. If you don't get no direction, you got to figure that out yourself. If, you, if the class tells you, you can modify the terms of the regatta to make it good for that class. And you can propose a rule change, but just don't expect it to happen if you've started racing already. That's not going to happen. Um, so this is a bigger group. So we're going to move on from this question, but think about it. Okay, so I need to get back here. Boat on boat rules questions. So we're going to move into, you know, what traditionally people think of as rules talks to boat on boat. Um, you know, I'm going to introduce this by just saying people often think, you know, port is wrong, starboard's right. There's a little more nuance than that, you know. And think about the right-of-way boat has limitations, the give-way boat has to keep clear. So even when you're right-of-way, rule 14 says you you have to avoid collision. So you're not supposed to hit somebody to prove that you were the right-of-way boat. So when we talk about rules, the more subtle way or the more complete way to talk us through the rules is what are the obligations of both boats, which boat has right-of-way, and then was a rule ever broken? And then if you want to do more of the classic boat-on-boat -boat stuff, I did find on YouTube a great talk it's actually an hour plus for just the part, uh, two rules, boat on boat, and then it's an hour on rule 18 and mark rounding. And it's from MYC, which I think is in New Zealand. The link's there. If you search racing rules of sailing, MYC, there's a great online talk that goes through around the race course, where the rules apply, what you do in different situations. We're also happy to go through those kind of questions now if we can get this format to work for everybody. Um, and Well, we, we saw, um, well, at least one question in the comments, right, when people registered. Do you mm -hmm. want to address, well, I guess sure. one was about, um, when do you get to do a tactical rounding versus a seaman-like rounding? Yeah. <laughs> um, um, and the answer uh, is, Go ahead. Only if you are the inside boat and have right of way. So just to explain that further, if you're coming into a lured gate and you're inside, if you're inside port and there's a starboard boat outside of you, the inside, inside port is owed mark room, but they don't have right of way. So outside starboard, has to give inside port mark room, but outside starboard is still right of way. So in that case, the only room that the inside boat is entitled to is the room to make a rounding. Whereas if you're overlapped windward lured and the inside boat is right of way and inside, then the inside boat has right of way and mark room and they get to make a tactical rounding. So that, that's the answer on when you can make each of those kind of roundings. All right, so move on to the next slide here. And here's just an example of what I was talking about. So it goes back to that slide, the port starboard cross of how close was it and who was right and who was wrong. And even though we think starboard has right of way, 
the details in this scenario, I can lay out a scenario where either boat is right or either boat is wrong. And port's obligation are to keep clear and port keeps clear when the right-of-way boat can sail their course with no need to take avoiding action and the right-of-way boat can change course. So the right-of-way boat changing course is more when you're overlapped and you're both on the same tack. And if you're both sailing together upwind and say right after the start or very close to a mark rounding, if you're right-of-way, you should be able to, to wiggle. You should be able to head up a little bit, head down a little bit, change your course, and you shouldn't be so close to the giveaway boat that that's a problem. So starboard's limitations are avoid contact. That's rule 14. We don't want, it's not bumper cars. We don't want boats hitting each other. The other thing is if they, it's different if you tacked into that situation as one, as yellow, or whether you were on that course. If you suddenly just appeared there, like you just finished your tack and just got there, when you acquire right away, you have to give the other boat room to keep clear. And then the other thing is if one, if yellow or one, sorry, they're both one, if yellow gets a lift here, they can't change course at the last minute and prevent port from keeping clear. So if there's a lift for starboard and starboard was then aiming right at the middle of port and port couldn't keep clear, if that happened after port was committed, then port was keeping clear, but it's not their fault they couldn't keep clear. The other thing is, on the other side, if port just cuts it too close and starboard has to avoid, if I would say in this situation, if starboard ducks and says, I had to dip to make sure I didn't hit them, that's really hard for port to get out of. So Jan, do you want to add anything or? No, I, I think it did a good job. So anyway, so any situation you ask, we're going to start with these basic principles of who is right of way, who had to keep clear, and once you establish those two things, what's, who's changing course? So is anyone being prevented from keeping clear? Is the starboard tacker holding their course and port was just in the way? So that's the way judges talk through the scenarios. Um, let's see. So I remember in the, um, so in the situations, in the questions, somebody asked, and we answered it earlier, but this is just sort of like a generic picture of sailing. Um, if you look at the boats coming in on the left and it's the pin, and imagine that's a downwind mark rounding, and the inside boat in this case is red, and the outside boats are gonna be blue and yellow. And because blue and yellow are on starboard, this is what we were talking about earlier, they have right of way, but they're gonna owe port mark room and port can only take the room around the mark because they don't have right of way. And if you got rid of red completely and it was just blue and yellow coming in, blue's inside and blue would have mark room. So that's, Pretty straightforward. Um, so, Laura, do we have any written questions about boat on boat questions? Uh, Daryl, we do. And you sort of just touched on it a little bit. Um, Joe Bukowski asked about a downwind finish, port versus starboard. Um, oh, okay, great. So, here which, we are. Which you kind of just brought up. Um, but if you need more um, about his, yeah. just ask Joe to uh, unmute right. himself and ask it. Okay. I think you got it. So, so actually, this is interesting. I, this is a slide that we use in judge training. And one of the interesting points, just to broaden this out, is these examples are totally different if this is a finish line, a starting line, and you've got to know where you're going. So at a start, the rules are different. At a finish, the rules are different. So back to what I was saying, I think I did cover a few minutes ago, but port on sorry, the red boat on port coming in. And if this was a finish line, I was talking about being a mark rounding a minute ago, but if this is a finish line, the two starboard tackers have right of way by rule 18, it's an overlap situation. Boats are owed mark room. So if port is overlapped at the three boat length circle and has the inside overlap, then 
She doesn't get right of way, but she gets mark room. So that's one of the changes in this new set of rules is that they used to turn right of way on and off and now they leave right of way always the same, but there's right of way and then there's whether you're owed mark room or not. Um, so yes, so in this case, port has mark room. They would be given just enough room to round the mark and the two starboard tackers would have to open up a hole and bear off and let the port tacker come in. So here's an interesting point which people don't think about very often. And I have to give Dave Dellenbaugh credit because he had a rules quiz and I failed it. And I was like, how did I fail that? Just imagine that we're, the three boats that we have coming at the committee boat, in your mind, move them over to the pin. And we're finishing up wind and we're coming in at the pin. So we have the blue boat on the port ley line coming in at the pin. We've got the green boat coming in on the ley line at the pin end. Can blue lee bow green? Most of us would say yes. I would have said yes. The issue is 18.3 is not turned off at a finish. So if you lee bow somebody at the port end of the line at the ball, you have to leave out them with enough room that the starboard tack boat doesn't have to go above close hauled and luck. So that's a nuance that most people don't think about that rarely comes up. You know, years ago, we used to come in on the port ley line to, to finish and we tack the starboard right underneath somebody and then literally luff them up to around the mark. And that was a move that we used to do when I was sailing much smaller boats years ago. That moves off the table now because you would break 18.3 at the finish. Um, so any, any other questions that we had that came in on yeah, the chat? So Daryl, there was a follow-on question at, in the finish scenario where uh, the question is, does Port have to jive right at, as they cross the line? And my answer is no. They're no. finishing. They, They're they don't have to jive, but they only get to take the room that they need the line so they don't have to jive but if the wind was slightly askew or the line wasn't square you don't get to stay on port and open up that hole bigger so right. you get the width of the boat the length of your boom and in the prevailing conditions you know a, a light air a couple feet and heavy air maybe a, a few more feet so you don't have to jive but i think the answer is you're, you have a defined amount of space and you need to sail through that defined amount of space. So they have to duck you then? No. What, what happens is both boats, in this scenario, red and blue would end up sailing essentially dead downwind at 90 degrees to the line. So port has to bear off and round the mark closely, only taking mark room starboard blue has to give them mark room they would both dial down to an almost dead downwind course and cross the finish line so that what i'm saying is port can't make starboard jibe port can make starboard this, bear off but port can't make starboard jibe so this is where they flip over <laughs> well <laughs> well it, it's it's um yeah, so port can't take any more room than they have to. And yes, I agree they should bear off, but I don't think they have to jive. Okay. So in a practical sense, very often port ends up driving, but they're not required to drive. Because what happens... Yeah, well, part, part of the question is, is if it's windy. Well, they're motivated not to drive if it's windy. <laughs> But what happens is you're still under the racing rules until you clear the finish line. So if the two boats end up downwind, one on port and one on starboard, and they cross the finish line, and they're still one on port and one on starboard, port still is required to keep clear of starboard after they cross the finish line. So you might not have to jive, but if it's heavy air, you got to be getting your chute down and be under control because port can't sail into starboard, it's still basically port starboard. Yeah, and, and bearing off dead downwind, absolutely, yes. Um, all right, so 
Any other questions that came up or anything else? Uh, right now it's quiet in the chat window. We don't have any questions. Yep. So I'm looking oh. at some of the things that came up. Um, we did just get one that came in. Um, what is the limit of a tactical rounding? I, I'd <laughs> say you have to uh, sail your proper course. So, you know, if, if you are that inside right-of-way boat in a, a mark rounding situation, you can probably go wide and come close, but you can't carry them past the mark. You've got to do what you would do in the absence of the other boat. Yeah, so, so if you're the inside boat and you don't have right-of-way, but you have mark room, it gets into all the things about it's just like a close cross in any situation. What's too close? In super light air, if you give me two feet, that's probably enough room. I don't think anyone's gonna say you took too much room or not enough room. You know, if you're, if you're the inside boat that doesn't have right of way and you're pushing the right of way boat five, 10 feet away from the mark, you're now, you know, you're not, you're taking more than the mark room to which you're entitled. So, you know, all the cases, if you look at the cases, they talk about the inside boat past the mark with a foot or two from the end of their boom to the mark, and they were three feet from their boat to the next boat. And that's like, they're like figuring out how much room does it take to round a mark? How much room does it mean? And if you're getting beyond those basic parameters of there's a couple feet between our boats as we round together, then that's starting to err on you're taking too much room. And that's what happens in protests. Like, was it too much? Was it not enough? What were the conditions? So, okay. So I'm just looking at if we had any other questions from the earlier part of the day. I think, that, I think we covered everything that came in on the, on the registrations. So Jan and I are happy to answer a few more questions. You know, we, we've covered the material we plan to cover. If anybody has any questions, you know, put them up in the chat so we can answer them. Um, there is a new one that just came in, Daryl. Yep. Um, is the principle of mass to beam in effect? No. It's been gone a long time. Yeah, that's like 15, 20 years ago. So that's no longer in effect. So the basic rules there are windward shall keep clear of leeward. So you just have the basic rule of windward leeward. And then you have rule 17, which is when it's one of the few times in the rule book. I think there's only two times when a boat's required to sail its proper course. And one is on rule 17, if you're a lured boat and you come in from behind and you get a lured overlap, you can't then luff up the windward boat above the proper course. So this is imagining, I know where the rule came from, it's imagining you're both sailing downwind, you have a bigger, faster boat that's going to lure it of a smaller, slower boat, and rule 17 says if you're overtaking to lure it from behind, then you can't sail as the lure boat above your proper course. So that's one of the few times. Um, and, and that's essentially the modern version of mass to beam is that rule 17 defines when a lure boat can't luff. So if we don't have any immediate questions, I'll just actually explain um, this slide up here and the reason we have it up. Actually, Art just posted a question. Yeah, and yep. there's another one after Art too. Okay, go for it. <laughs> do you I want to? How much do you? How much do you reach out to sailors during the regatta, such as considering communications with the locals concerning local conditions? Do you find specific main contact? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so that sounds like during the regatta, what input do you want? And I'm going to actually take a page, you know, from 
Tom Duggan, I believe. Yep, Tom Duggan, who gave that good PRO speech a couple of weeks ago. And he says he always wants to hear from the competitors. And as a judge, you know, I don't want to be debating the rule book, like, does, is port right or port wrong? But in terms of either, I don't even want to say questionable calls, but I mean discretionary calls, like, you know, when's the wind come up? You know, do we race in the morning, do we race in the afternoons? Um, one of the good things about to keep in mind is, you know, there can be friction when either an out-of-town judge or an out-of-town PRO comes to a club and they know how to run races and they've been running races a long time and then the out-of-towner shows up. Both sides of that have to have a little humility and have to listen to each other because the locals know their town, where you can anchor marks, where you can't anchor marks, which way the wind's going to blow. It's going to be windy in the morning or the afternoon. And then occasionally local clubs get a little stuck in their ways and having someone who watches races from other places can give them a few suggestions and help them out. So if both sides are listening to each other, it's great for there to be a dialogue. Um, I mean, what I like to hear from competitors is the tenor of the regatta, like, you know, I, I like to hear about problems before they become protests. I'll just be honest. Like if there's something that's gnawing at the fleet and there's a notice you can put on the board, there's an announcement, like somebody can have their question answered and that takes care of the issue. Like the first time I hear about a problem, it's not when I get the three page redress form dropped off at the, at the race committee desk. I mean, sometimes that's the right answer. Sometimes something just came up, there was nothing to be done about it. It really is a protest. That's the right way the thing could be handled. But if it's more a discretionary thing of we're racing too many hours in a day, we're not racing enough, we want to be in for dinner, we don't want to be in for dinner. Like if there are routine calls and the fleet has an opinion, those are good things to know. Jan, you want to add anything? Um, yeah, I mean, if, if somebody has a problem, they come up to you early, you can solve it. Um, and before it becomes an issue that, and I mean, getting back to Art's question, the more we can find out from the locals in advance um, and anticipate issues, the better off we are, the happier the judges are going to be, the competitors and the PRO, everybody. Nobody wants to be miserable at a regatta where you're trying to have fun, including the volunteers. That's right. Years ago, I was at Regatta, I was listening on the radio, and the race, the PRO was being a little nudgy. He was like, move the weather mark, move the weather mark back, move the weather mark again, move it back the other way. Okay, would you pull it up and drop it again? And after an hour or two of this, finally from the weather mark boat came back, I am a volunteer. So you do got to remember that we're all in this to have fun, and we're all in this to do the best job that we know how to do. So was there another question after Arts? Yes, um, I got one. How should the jury take possession of video evidence offered at a hearing? Um, I'm going to key in on the phrase take possession of because the rules say the person who wants the evidence submitted has to provide it and provide the playback equipment. So if I'm the jury and you as the protester want evidence, you, I want you to bring it in and show it to us. Now, when you say take possession, if it's easy, if you can email me a copy or you can make a copy available, um, that's great because in most cases, the chief judge is going to want to look at it before you get to the hearing. Now, if you're right in a hearing and somebody says, do you have any evidence and you want to present it, that's perfectly fine. But you know, there are a lot of times where someone thinks they have this brilliant piece of video or this brilliant piece of photography, and it really doesn't answer the questions the judges have. So I don't want to say it's wrong to bring in evidence, but a lot of times, you know, you want to think through the hassle of it, think through whether it's germane. A good judge is not going to say don't show it. A good judge is always going to say whatever evidence you have, please present. But I'm relying on the person bringing the evidence to present it. And then if there's a way to make a copy available that's straightforward, like email it, leave a thumb drive, let us put a copy in our computer for us, that's the way to do it. The other problem with video evidence these days is 
what control does the OA have over the video evidence? Like if I'm a competitor, if I'm a judge, does the OA control who the media person is? Does the media person own all their own stuff? I, I know about this from my own work, not from sailing. But, you know, if you walk up to the media person who's trying to like get the photos up and get them up for the regatta party and put a few on sale, like it's not his priority to, to give you the evidence for a hearing when you want the evidence right then and there. And it is also reasonable to say, I know that there's a video or pictures of this incident. I couldn't get them for this hearing. Do we want to proceed with the hearing now or do we want to delay until I can get the evidence? My feeling about that is I would probably have the hearing and we don't want to let a hearing drag out for like two or three days in the middle of regatta. We try to want to resolve it. But then if the, the evidence truly changes what you see or is truly new, then we might reopen. But I think many juries would want to hear it based on the testimony of the people, of the competitors. And then if the person in charge of the video says that's going to be a day or two later, deal with that then. So Jan, anything to add? Yeah, um, I, I think the perspective of taking possession of is not the usual perspective judges use. So mm -hmm. when a competitor um, in, brings video evidence into a hearing, we watch it and based on what we see, we find facts. We don't generally, I'll say, take a copy of that video evidence and make it a fact. So, so it's a little, uh, we don't usually take possession of it necessarily. Uh, Daryl, do you agree with that? Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, you know, we, so, so the, the facts and the protests will be the facts found in the written decision. I don't ever remember somebody saying, and this video is part of the fact found. It's the written yeah, fact. I've never, I've never done that. We just use it to determine the fact. Yep. Okay. I guess hopefully that answered the question. Yep. Okay, Laura, what's up next? We don't have any other questions uh, that have come in. Uh, All right. Someone has a last minute one. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna just talk through this scenario real quick. The one that I have up, um, the, the boats, the finish line. Um, I think that's still up for everybody to see it. So I put this up as a brain teaser when we're doing judges training and I say, which boat do you wanna be? And let's ignore the downwinds for the moment, let's just say it's the three upwind, the three boats that are sailing upwind. Um, the, the trick is, it totally depends if this is a start or a finish. So if this is a finish, I think I wanna be the gray boat. The, the gray boat's gonna be owed mark room. The green boat's gonna have to bear off to give gray room to finish. The blue boat's gonna have to tack because they're on port and avoid. So at an upwind, I would say the gray boat has the advantage in this scenario or likely has the advantage. It's all close. They're drawn on purpose. They're drawn to be relatively even. Um, if this is a start, if we're coming in and we're in the last 10 or 20, 10 or 15 seconds of the start, gray is about to get hosed. So Gray is, nobody legally uses the term anymore, barging, but there is no mark room at a starting mark. Green's right on the ley line. All green has to do is luff up just a little bit, and that's going to force um, gray off. And I think green's going to have a good start here. I mean, you know, blue could re rebound and be in the perfect position, but likely blue's going to attack and then green's going to start. A real nuance of this is, if you're green and you're at the start and you want to box out a boat up on your hip, you have to luff them up before the two of you get to the committee boat because you have to give the boat without right of way, the gray boat in this case, you have to give them an opportunity to keep clear. So if you stay on these two courses and let's imagine they were just slightly down from the ley line then exactly where I drew them. 
and Gray got their nose in behind the race committee boat, you can't luff them up into the race committee boat and cause a collision. So once Gray gets their nose in under the race committee boat, then the race committee is an obstruction, even though rule 18 doesn't give them room to be in there. Rule 14 says the boat with right of way can't cause a collision. So I've had competitors tell me like I left them up and yeah, you left them up right into the side of the committee boat. That's too late. So I, I think, um, I don't want to belabor the point, but if you're in the situation where green is, you want to make it clear that there's no room by luffing gray up like a boat length, half a boat length before the committee boat so they can tack away. And you can't luff them up once they get their nose in behind the committee boat. So Jan, anything to add on that? Sorry, it took me a minute to unmute. No, uh, I totally agree. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, so our goal was to wind down by 6.30. Um, I, I hope everybody found this informative. If, if there's any other questions in the chat, I'm gonna give everybody a minute or two to get their last minute questions in. We have five or 10 more minutes possibly. There, if, there yeah. actually is, a, there is another question. Okay. Um, at the start, uh, EL. Port Leeward. Port Leeward. Okay. Backs to starboard, and after the start, must luff above close hull to make the starting mark, and forces a close starboard boat above close hull. So, so you're you're moving the the blue boat and the green boat down to the buoy end. So it seems like yeah. Okay. Um, so after the start, must luff above close hall to make, well, they can. Mm -hmm. Right? Could you, could you just read the question out loud again? Oh, at the start, port lowered tax to starboard, and this is down at the, the buoy end of the starting. Yep. And after the start, must luff above close hull to make the starting mark and force a close starboard boat above close hull. Yeah, so I would say that's possible because once port has tacked on the starboard, assuming it's a clean tack and everything's good, they're now lured boat. And they don't have a rule 17 luffing restriction. So, the mark at a, at a starting line, the mark rounding things don't apply. So 18 and all that, 18, three. Because this is after the start here. Right, but, the, but we're at a starting line. Right. So yeah, so if green, or so if blue and green were down at the pin end and blue tacked right at the pin and they make a clean tack and don't tack too close, then they can luff around the mark. Yes, I would say that's true. Okay. All right. I think that is it. That's it. Okay. Nothing else is coming in on the chat. Well, uh, I'd I'll like to thank everybody for attending. And um, this was recorded, so Laura's going to have a copy of this. Um, I'd like to thank the Lightning class and Laura for putting this on and being hosts. I'd like to thank Art for you know, suggesting the snipes join in. And I'd like to thank Jan for being my partner and making this happen. So we're, we're in the last 30 seconds. <laughs> One last question or we're done. So. You guys are just getting a lot of accolades. <laughs> okay. Everyone loved it. And, and Jan and Daryl, thank you so much for your work on this presentation. Uh, it's been back and forth for um, a couple weeks and um and we really thank you for your time in putting this together and and sharing your your knowledge with us so thank you you're welcome you're welcome so thank you everybody so in a different time in a different place it'd be a little more interactive but we used the technology as best we could so i hope everybody enjoyed it so thank you they did all right um thank you all for coming and uh hopefully we'll see you out on the water sometime soon. Have a great night. Okay.